Uh, today's scripture is going to be John 5, 1 through 15. Not first John, John. That's the healing at the pool. All right. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast for, of the Jews. Now they're in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Beth, Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. I am trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place, a Sabbath, was a Sabbath. And so the Jew said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So you might recognize this title. It was supposed to be last week's sermon, but we didn't get that far, did we? So let's start with prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come here and worship you. We thank you for your words that stand true to the test of time. Lord, we do thank you that these men got to walk in your land and can come back with a renewed spirit and see the places where that you did teach and that you did heal. And Father, just help us to be able to tell others about that so that they can enjoy our experiences, and most of all, so that they can see Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we were over in Israel, and I forgot to do this last week, we got some little wall magnets for you guys to put on your refrigerator or wherever you want to put them. They're different ones. This one says, blessings for the home. May this home be blessed with love and peace. May this home be blessed with health, joy, and prosperity. This one says, Shalom. This one says, God bless our house. There's one with Israel. And my favorite, Shalom, y'all. Okay? So I want every household to get one. Some people got them last week because I remember they were standing around and said, what is this? I'm like, ooh, I'm sorry. And these are supposed to be made of olive wood from Israel. I looked all over for Made in China stickers. I did not find any. But I can't guarantee you anything. So please, everyone, get one. And the kids, we gave out shekels. And if any kids didn't get any shekels, I have a few more in there. One of the things, if you'll give me that picture, that we know where we walked, we know one of them for a fact was the place it was. So many of them were speculation that this was a place that this happened or this was a place because there's been so much turmoil and destruction and everything over the years. But this is the pool at Bethesda. It is described, and they found the columnades. It marks where it should be at and everything else. So pretty much we feel like this is actually that part. And if you'll notice, it's down because everything in Jerusalem is built up on top. It's because it's destroyed. They build again. It's destroyed. It's built again. So they had to dig down to those pools. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is a place where Jesus literally walked and healed. John 5, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Now, Bethesda means house of mercy or flowing water. So let's remember that as we go on. And which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of, peop of disabled people used to lie, the blind, blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Notice here that says a great number. Whenever Jesus came around, there was a great number. The problem is, is Jesus is calling out to people and saying, Will you follow me? 
I don't want fans. That's what we're studying about in our Sunday school. I want committed followers. He never said, come on and enjoy me. He said, come follow me. That meant to walk in His footsteps. Not literally, but spiritually with what He taught. To live a life that He told us to, to live. By His words and by His actions. Where else would it be a proper place for people to gather except a place where they knew they need healing? So many times we don't think we need healing, especially in this country, because we think that we are so blessed, and we are. But our blessings here are material. They're things that don't last. And sometimes we forget that and we make them our gods. We get satisfied with those things rather than living a life that pursues Jesus Christ, that pursues His teachings, a life of worthiness, following after the footsteps of Jesus. So I challenge you today to not be complacent, to go to that place where you can get healing. Many people, a great number, came to this place for healing. And Jesus showed up and they had an encounter with Jesus. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and the first part of 6 say, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, not only walk again, but leap like a deer. And the mute tongue shall shout for joy, not only speak, but shout for joy. Why? Because they have received healing, not just physical healing, because every time Jesus has an encounter with someone, just like the woman at the well, He points out, here is why I'm here. I'm not here just to heal you of whatever infirmities you have on this earth, but I am here to give you springs of living water. This place was known as flowing water, but Jesus came there to give them living water, to give them life abundantly, so that they could have faith, they could have hope, and that they could love one another. That's what Jesus offered, and that's what Isaiah foretold about. Jesus did these miracles to fulfill prophecy, of course. But He did these miracles because He had compassion. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus came because He knew the Father's will. The Father's will was that no one would perish. No one. No matter what they ever did, no matter what they ever would do. He loved them just the same. We don't have to get right and come to Jesus. Jesus comes to us. And he says, I don't care if you're laying in the slop and the mud just like the lost son. I want you to return home. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am here because the Father loved you and because I love you. Verse, the, verse 4, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4, you might have noticed when Ken put it there, it says, see footnote. Because it's in the King James Version, but it's not in the later uh, versions of the Bible. The reason being, when the King James Version was written, it was found in manuscripts. Later, when we found earlier manuscripts, we did not find the verses, so we have omitted them from the NIV and from other versions. But I want to read you what these this verses said. It says, And they waited for the moving of the waters. For time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Now maybe it was superstition. Maybe an angel did come. Angels are known in the Bible for taking care of us. That's part of their job, for, for providing healing. Another thing they're known for is announcing the coming of the Messiah, isn't it? And Jesus was going to come to this pool. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. All I know is Jesus came to heal the lame, the mute, the blind. But you've got to decide if you want to be healed, don't you? And that's what this story goes on to say. Verse 5 says, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now it doesn't say how old this man was. It does say sir, so we figure it's a man, not a woman. But we don't know how old this person was. But the average lifespan in that day, with all of the turmoil, with the Roman invasion and everything else, the average lifespan was probably 40, maybe 50 at best. So this guy had been a paralytic for most all of his life. He'd been one so long. We haven't been married that long yet, have we, honey? And it seems like forever, 27 years. This, this guy had been an invalid for 38 years. A long time. He didn't know any different. He probably accepted that this is the way I'm going to be. I'm here at this pool because I have a little bit of hope. 
But nothing's ever going to change because I'm hopeless. But you're not hopeless because if you were hopeless, God wouldn't have sent His Son, would He? So you have hope. Don't ever think you're hopeless because God gave His Son for you. Wow. As Lowell would say, wow. <laughs> hope I did that pretty good. <laughs> so it had been 38 years. Maybe this man was the most in need. Maybe he was the one that had the most faith. Maybe he was just someone randomly that Jesus picked out of the crowd. But Jesus does make His invitation personal. He comes to you and shows you that He is God. And that's what He did first. He showed him that He was someone. The man didn't understand who, but he had to understand that the power came from God. Verse 6 says, When Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Think back of the prodigal son again, or the lost son. I don't like calling him the prodigal son. Because especially today, that might have been something in that day that kids didn't do, but it's something kids definitely pretty much do today. They go to that foreign land because the world tells them, and that's why we have to tell them so much more, that that is where they're going to find peace and hope. That's where their needs are going to be satisfied. And if we don't tell them otherwise, then how will they ever get up out of that mud and return home? We are a light to them. We have an obligation. And scriptures tell us if we train up a child in the ways of the Lord, he will not depart from it. There might be a season when he goes off or she goes off to that foreign land. But hopefully they'll return if we've grounded them in the scriptures. You have to decide you want to get well. And that's what Jesus asked the man. He had compassion on him. Many times throughout the New Testament, it says that Jesus had compassion. Jesus had compassion. It doesn't say it here, but I know that He did because I read it throughout Scriptures. He had compassion on this man and said, Do you want to get well? Because if you don't, you can sit there in your misery. You can lie in that filthy slop. You can stay in the foreign land. But if you want to get well, Jesus can provide you with that, can He? Whatever the healing is, whether it's physical or definitely if it's spiritual. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Praise be to the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. That's the only place you're going to find true peace and true comfort who comforts, comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We're supposed to pass that on, aren't we? So when we're a light, when we're the hands and feet, we're also supposed to show compassion and love, aren't we? I said it earlier when Jesus said, A new commandment I give you. It wasn't a new commandment. The Ten Commandments, the first ones are about God, the second ones are about people. If you obey those commands, you will love God. You will love others. But Jesus came. That's why it's a new commandment. Because we have seen God's love given to us in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ. And now comes a time of total healing. A time of total restoration. And once we have been called and we answer this call to get up and be healed, then we're called to help heal others and help comfort others. And we have an opportunity to do that today. We're going into the junior high school to have a meal for Thanksgiving, to be thankful to Jehovah God, not some foreign God in some foreign land. And we have the chance to witness. Jacob has tracts that we're going to hand out. We're going to be in the school teaching Jesus. Can you believe that? So we need all of your help, and we ask you to pray, pray, pray. Whenever Jesus had something important in front of him, he took time to pray to the Father about it. So I ask you today, in everything you're doing besides serving, pray. Pray to open the hearts of these people that come. There are a lot of people that we've been exposed to yesterday in the high school and today in the junior high that won't come to church, that don't want to get healed. Whether they know who does the healing or not, they have chosen to stay there and lay there on their mat in the mud. We have a chance today to be the light of the world and we've got to start that with fervent prayer and then we've got to take action in our service. God has compassion 
And He's called us to be compassionate. So remember, every opportunity you get to act like a Christian, like Christ. So I ask you today, do you really want healing? If you want to get healed, here's the man's response in verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one, and the King James Version says man, to help me. It means he had no servant. He was poor. Not only was he crippled, but he was poor in this world. He was a bum, as we might call him. I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I was trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now we read here also that the water was stirred, so we see the tradition that we found in the verses that were omitted. Again, like I said, it doesn't matter what those traditions were or anything else. It matters that Jesus came. And Jesus came to provide total healing and restoration. But this guy makes an excuse, doesn't he? We always do. The woman at the well did. She said, let's talk about religion. And Jesus said, no, let's talk about salvation through me. He gets in your face, just like the man that had his vision healed. His vision was healed in part, but he let Jesus poke around some more so that he could see clearly. And that's what happens here. This man makes an excuse, but Jesus says to him, Get up. Now it's time to put up or shut up, isn't it? Do you want to be healed or not? If you do, respond, get up. And he put some stipulations to it. Pick up your mat and walk. Okay? <laughs> That means he called him to be a testimony. I don't know if you've thought about this or not. But the mat that he carried was nothing more than a coat, a uh, little blanket, whatever it was. It was just something to keep him from getting sores on the hard ground. It wasn't a mattress. It surely wasn't a Sealy Posturepedic mattress that we have and some big down pillows or, or whatever we feel comfortable with. He was there to get healing. He had been there for quite a while trying to get to healing that would never come. So you know he had to be distraught. He had to be, just gave up hope because he would never get to those healing waters. Someone else would not show compassion and get down there in front of him. If only he had a servant to help him or if only someone would show him compassion, but no one ever would. So he was hopeless. But Jesus said, get up. That takes faith, doesn't it? Just like when Peter said, if it is you, Jesus, tell me to come to you. And then what did he do? He stepped out of the boat. And all of the other disciples watched, didn't they? When they could have been out there dancing on the water too. He said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. It was the Sabbath. We'll get to that in a second. If he picked up his mat, he was going to be noticed. Okay? So when we decide to get up, so many times we don't want to carry that testimony around with us. We want to put it back in our closet and keep it there. But that testimony is about what Jesus did for us. How He did come to us when we were in the mud laying in our, on our mat. So He tells this man, pick up that mat and walk and be a testimony to me. And what happened? Verse 9, at once, immediately, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. So many times when we get a command from God, whether it's directly in His Word or whether it's a feeling that we have or whatever, we question and say, oh, wait a minute, God, are you sure about that? Maybe not right this second, but later after I get this accomplished. What if this guy would have hesitated? Would Jesus still have compassion and healing? Probably, because that's what God does. But He would not have been a testimony that He could have been, would He? He wouldn't have got in the Pharisee's face it said a great crowd was there. Many were there. All of them got to see this miracle also. At least if they didn't see, if the crowd was too great, somebody saw, who told somebody else, who told somebody else. They didn't even know who the man was. But they knew that this man, who had been lame and paralyzed for 38 years, now walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Here's where we have trouble and controversy, isn't it? Jesus doesn't call our walk to be easy. He calls our walk to be a light, a testimony, a helping hand, a compassionate offer to someone else, acts of service, kindness, so that people see Jesus in our lives. Verse 10 says, And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, 
They had no compassion. They knew the law, but they had no compassion or love. And that's why they missed who the Messiah was. It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. You are in trouble, buddy. You broke the law and you're going to pay for it. But, and you know I hate that word and love that word, because it means the complete opposite. But, I love it in this case. The man replied, the man who made me well, he said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And that's what I did. I didn't question him. He said, do this, and I did it. I don't even know who he is. It goes on to say that. He walked by faith because the one that told him to get up. Not because Jesus told him to get up, but the one who healed him told him to get up. And he had enough faith, not even knowing that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He had enough faith to get up and be a testimony. Verse 12 says, So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick, up, pick it up and walk? Man didn't know. He had no clue. He just knew that once he was lame and now he was walk well, he could walk. He knew that he once was blind, but now he could see. He knew that he was deep in sin and deprivation or whatever it was, and now he was healed. He didn't have to be feel less than anymore. He didn't have to be ashamed. He could live his life whatever time he had left, whether it was almost over or he had many years in front of him. And he could be a testimony for what happened that day. All have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This man doesn't even realize this yet. Verse 14 though, later Jesus found him because Jesus is going to come to you and ask you again and again, will you come follow me? Will you be obedient? Will you be the light to the world? Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you're well again. Stop sinning. There's where Jesus proves his Godhead. He had the authority to tell him to stop sinning. Not that this man's sin put him in this condition at all. But he had been healed by the Messiah, by Jesus, the only one who can offer true healing. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Maybe it will be in this lifetime, maybe it would be in the next. But Jesus can save you from the next, can He? He's the only way that can save you from the next, from the impending judgment of God on sin. God doesn't want to judge sinners, He wants to judge sin. He makes a way of escape for sinners if they'll choose just to get up. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders. So he went back for more trouble, didn't he? Wow. He went back and said it was Jesus who made him well. He didn't just stop in the first place when they said, you're in trouble, buddy, you broke the law. He went back for some more of it because he realized who Jesus was. And he said, I will follow you. I will take my mat wherever you tell me to go, and I will be a testimony and light to the world. It's maybe ironic, maybe it's not, that this was a pool of healing, that it was the sheep gate that was there. Now, I don't know, Scripture doesn't say, but I think Jesus came through that gate because isn't He the only way? Doesn't He call His sheep to follow Him? And if they respond, they hear the voice of their master, don't they? They won't follow anyone else because they recognize His voice. And this was a pool of mercy where Jesus came to give God's ultimate grace and mercy. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's not. But I like to think it was specific because Jesus comes specifically to seek and to save the lost. Matthew Chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter in it. But small is the gate and narrow the gate that leads to life, and only a few find it. If you go back and you read in history and you read some in the Bible, you'll find that this gate probably was a gate where they brought in sheep and cleansed them at the pool so that they could offer sacrifice for their sin. It's complete now when Jesus came. There is no need anymore. The sins have been covered once and for all by the blood of the Lamb. What a tremendous thing to have happened there. And we got to see it, guys. 
We got to see where that was. We, we know that that's where that was. So it can bring that to life that much more. In Nehemiah, we read about the sheep gate. Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Elisab, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and rebuild the sheep gate. This is during the rebuilding of the walls by Nehemiah. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hanel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zachor, son of Emery, built next to them. The building, rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem started at the Sheep Gate, where we're supposed to enter through, where the Savior came through to show healing once and for all. Not temporary healing, but true healing. The name Elisha, if I said it correctly, means God restores. That's kind of ironic too, isn't it? That that's the priest who rebuilt the gate. God restores. Because God restores through Jesus Christ the Son. In verse 32, the last verse in Nehemiah 3, 3 says, "...in between the room above the corner and the sheep gates, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs." The building, rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem began and ended at the sheep gate. The gate that Jesus came in to offer this man healing. Not just healing from his crippled life on this earth, but healing for abundant life in heaven forevermore. John 10 verses 2 through 4 says, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out, when he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. That's what it means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. To hear his voice, follow his commands, follow his call, follow his lead, so that others may know the love of the Father and be restored to him. So I ask you today, do you want to get healed? If you want to get healed, are you responding? And if you're responding, how can you be an example and a light to this earth? You have an opportunity today to serve. And I will say one thing, and Jacob has seen it too, because he pointed out to me, I said, I already know it, son. This is a loving, giving church, and I am proud to serve here. There are more people helping from this church than any other church. I didn't say that so you can repeat it or so you can get proud about it or anything. Just the fact that we have a loving church and it makes me proud that you guys understand God's calling and you do your best to do it. But we can always do more because the harvest is plenty and the workers are few. Don't forget that. Spend time today praying for whatever action you can have and that souls will be prepared to hear the gospel message. Because it's just amazing to me that we've been given this opportunity in the last couple of days to reach out, to break denominational barriers, to tell of the love of Jesus Christ so that people can get healing, so that they can know why God did love them so much. Because so many times they do get complacent sitting there on their mat. They think there is no hope. Because no one else in this world will help them. They don't have anybody. So the only help they have is Jesus. And how are they going to know Jesus unless we come to them with Jesus? He's not here now. And He commissioned us to be His hands and feet. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for the love that You gave to us. I thank You for the example of Christ. I thank You that all throughout Scripture, wherever You pick up and read, You see of Your love, Father and the coming promise of Jesus Christ, and the hope that we have that no matter what, if we have been born again and sealed by the Spirit, that we will spend eternity with You. That when our friends and loved ones pass on that do know You, Father, that it's not goodbye, it's just a delayed hello. And we thank You for the people that do get up and follow You. Help us to be a church full of individuals that follows You with all of our heart, Father that we may bring glory and honor to You, and that we may lead other sheep to the gate of true life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.